Hello, everybody. So um, feel free if you have any issues you can't hear, um, let me know as we're going along and, and um, we'll address that. So we're gonna talk about colorectal wellness. Um, Dr. Shanker and I are gonna kind of piggyback on each other. I'm gonna tell you all the things your colorectal surgeon wants you to know and you would hear at an appointment from us. And Dr. Shanker is gonna talk kind of about preventing, like the power that you have of prevention. So those are married together and we're really excited to share this information with you. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, like uh, we'll be saying afterwards and answering whatever you want. So we'll get started. So first of all, we'll talk about colon anatomy. It's really important to understand why we care, right? We all know that we have a colon, but the point is, is why do we care that we have a colon? Well, thankfully, the colon is uh, does a lot of different things for us, some that we actually get credit for and some that we don't always give credit for. So it absorbs water and also helps aid in electrolyte balance. So it does help our potassium and our B12 and some of the important things absor be absorbed, which is important. It also, the bacteria in the colon also help break down some of the food that we're eating that isn't broken down in the small bowel. And the leftover material, the, the biggest function that we all know and love is that the colon actually stores stool, moves it through down to the rectum and then allows it, us to pass it when we want to. So the colon and the rectum are really, really important in our quality of life. And people always ask, you know, why do you wanna do this job? Because if your colon, your rectum, your anus doesn't work, it's miserable for multiple reasons. And so it is a huge quality of life issue. And that's one of the reasons that um, Dr. Shanker and I love doing what we're doing. Colorectal health depends on a few factors. One of them being diet, exercise, appropriate chronic transit. So that means diarrhea and con avoiding diarrhea and constipation, ergonomics of pooping, perianal care, or how you're wiping yourself or not wiping yourself, and staying cancer free, which is really important. So we'll kind of cover all of these different topics throughout the entire presentation. Fiber, most important thing, Dr. Shanker is gonna talk a lot about diet. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of leave that part to her, the diet part with colorectal cancer, but fiber is the most important thing that we do not get in our diet. So Americans get about 40 to 50% of the amount of fiber that we need in our diet daily. Men need anywhere from 35 to 38. Women need 20 to 25. So 25 to 35 is kind of the, uh, the what we quote we usually get about 10. So it's really important for gut health. It can help you lose weight. It helps regulate your blood sugar spikes. It improves your colonic transit. It improves heart health and also reduces your colon cancer risk. So here's a fiber, a table of fiber content of food. And there's different types of fiber. So there's the soluble fiber, which is the, it helps slow your digestion by creating a gel-like substance. Examples of that are apples, carrots, oats, and barley. And then there's insoluble fiber, which helps food move through the digestive tract. That's like cauliflower and green beans. Over on the right side of the screen, you'll see some fiber content of food. And so it's funny because people, you'll notice that there's nowhere on here does it say salad. People think that salad has a lot of fiber. When you say to someone, oh, you know, you need to increase your fiber, they'll say, I eat a lot of salad. Salad actually has no fiber in it or all, very little, spinach does. But actually the things that go on top of the salad are the things that help you get your fiber. So the chickpeas, the avocado, the bananas, the blackberries, everything, all the colors of the rainbow that go on top of the salad is actually where you get your fiber from. So it's important that you're getting your fiber daily to make sure that your, your colonic transit is where it's supposed to be. And fiber is wonderful because people think, well, if I have diarrhea and I add fiber, isn't it going to make it worse? Or if I have constipation and I add fiber, isn't it going to bulk it more? Actually, fiber is like the great, the great middleman. It keeps the constipation in the middle. It brings the diarrhea in the middle. It really makes your bowel movements normal. And that's what we want. So fiber is, the, if you remember nothing else from my talk today, please, please remember, increase your fiber. And we'll talk about some easy ways to do that in just a second. So... Easy ways to increase daily fiber, replace white bread, white rice, pasta with whole grain alternatives, add flax seeds or chia seeds to your to each of the meals. So if you get two grams of fiber per serving and you add it to every meal or snack, you can increase your fiber to 12 grams, which would then, if you're getting 10 and you increase to 12, you're already at your daily 
kind of close to where you need to be daily and that will help significantly. The other thing is choosing fiber rich snacks. So raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, apples, almonds, things that are going to keep you full for longer, but also help add that fiber to your GI tract and keep things moving. Start your day with fiber. A lot of us, you know, grab things that are sweet or um, maybe don't last as long. You really, if you can start your day with some fiber, even if it's oats or grains or nuts or something that's gonna last longer, you'll have less of those blood sugar spikes that will not make you as hungry throughout the day. So really getting your fiber in the morning is a good idea. And then also adding a daily fiber supplement. That's also a wonderful idea. So I love Citrus L. I do not get paid by Citrus L, I promise. It is my absolute favorite. Um, because it, the way that it's metabolized, Metamucil a lot of times will create gas. And for patients what, who were trying to increase their fiber, if we create gas, they'll stop using it, right? So I always say fiber is kind of like tennis shoes. Some people like Asics, some people like Nike, some people like Reebok. It doesn't matter what kind of fiber you get. It matters that you're going to take it. So while I do like citrus all the best, people tolerate it the most, there's, um, lots of different ones that you can use. There's Benefiber, there's more whole, like Whole Foods sells fiber. There's a lot of different options. Um, some people like more natural and they don't wanna take processed or uh, over-the-counter things. And that's okay too. As long as you're getting your fiber, I don't care where it comes from. Exercise is so important. So this study looked at the amount of exercise that inactive individuals have and the amount of exercise that active individuals have and their colon cancer risks, not just colon cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, heart disease, ischemic stroke. Basically it shows that with every increase in exercise, you decrease your risk of cancers. So I think that's one of the most important things from a standpoint of moving. And the other thing that happens is a lot of the people who struggle with constipation are people who don't move. They're not moving, they're sitting, they have very, um, their lives and jobs that aren't moving. And so if you don't add that movement into your di into your daily activity, your gut also pays for it. So one of the biggest ways that you can help battle constipation or regulate your GI tract is by moving. And anything is better than nothing. So it is very overwhelming to go from zero to 60. So even if you go from zero to five, five to 10, 10 to, you know, whatever you can do, is gonna be better than doing nothing. So I think that's another really good point to remember. So again, these are kind of the toileting 101. This is my slide. This is like the take home slide. Take a picture of this slide, please. So this is what the colorectal surgeon, if you come to my office, these are the tips and tricks that I'm gonna share with you and tell you to do, right? This is what we wanna tell everyone in the world to do to poop better. So first, avoid constipation or diarrhea. We do not want you straining. We do not wanna overuse the anal canal. We really want you to be able to empty, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but we wanna make sure that we're not forcing it, right? Go when you need to go, don't hold it. You would be so surprised how many people hold their bowel movements because they don't wanna go in public, they would only wanna go at home, they only wanna go dirty, and I get that, I totally get that, but at the same time, when you're holding it, you're teaching your rectum and you're teaching your colon to not tell you when you need to go and then it makes it harder later. So please, please go when you need to go. Do not sit for more than three to five minutes. So this is not the time to pull out your iPad or pull out your iPhone or play Wordle or do any of the things that you're supposed to be doing except for pooping. So this is not the time to finish your book. This is the time to poop. It is important because if you sit for more than three to five minutes, you're straining whether you, you think you are or not, and your hemorrhoids are gonna come out or you're gonna have other anorectal pathology that we're trying to avoid. Please look at your poop. I know it sounds crazy. People are freaked out about it. They don't like doing it, but it tells a story. What you can see with your bowel movements look different. If, if your colors are changing, if, you're, if it's floating, there's a lot of information you get from your bowel movements. And so over here on the right side is called the Bristol scale. We use this often in our office to kind of see where patients are at. So type one is separate hard lumps. So we call them rabbit poop, right? Type two is lumpy. Three and four is kind of where we want you. 
five and six and, and seven are getting in more to the diarrhea. So it's, it's important for you to be able to look at the bowel movement to know, is there blood? Is there anything I need to worry about? Because that tells you that you need to come to us and we, and we need to work together to figure out what's going on. Use a squatty potty. This is one of the best things that you could ever invest in. It is not expensive. It is $20. You can buy it online. We'll talk about why in a second, but it helps to keep the, to twitch the ergonomics in your pelvic floor to help straighten your pelvic floor so you can actually evacuate. Really, really important. Consider a bidet for those patients who, and it does not mean that it has to be expensive. There does not need to be a $500 bidet. Ours is from Amazon. It's $40. It's amazing. But it helps because the more you minimize wiping, as a society, we have a tendency to overwipe. We feel like we constantly have to be clean. And so we will wipe and wipe and wipe. And sometimes we make our own problems. So avoid overwiping. A bidet or padding is best. And also avoid wipes with chemicals. So if you want to use wipes, you need to use baby wipes, please use like water wipes or something that doesn't have chemicals in it because you can create your own contact dermatitis in the perianal area because the skin is so thin. It's the same skin that you have on the inside of your cheek and you wouldn't put alcohol-based stuff on the inside of your cheek. So please don't do it on your butt. Your butt will thank you. <clears throat> so to talk about the squatty potty, it is a game changer. So when, when people poop, they also oftentimes think that they're supposed to, the higher the toilet, the better. That's actually not the case. There's a reason we've been squatting for years, decades, centuries. And it's because it increases the amount, it changes the angle of pooping. So your puborectalis muscle, which is the muscle that wraps around your rectum, it actually allows that puborectalis muscle to relax so that your bowel movements can come out straight. What a concept, right? Otherwise, your puborectalis muscle like the, the, the picture on the left, squeezes and actually it's, it's smashed and then the stool can't get out. So you end up having what's called obstructive defecation or I wanna poop, but I can't. So patients who don't have a straight anal canal will oftentimes feel like they can't empty, like they're, they're having, once they have a bowel movement, they're not done. They'll get up and walk around multiple times and have clustering of bowel movements. And so it really is a problem for these patients when this is happening. And so this is one of the things just, and it does, even if it's not a squatty potty, even if it's an upside down stool uh, or trash can, whatever it is to keep your knees above your hips, this will help significantly and, and help with your defecatory ergonomics. Again, this is another picture. On the left side, when you're sitting, you're, and it's, everything is straight at a 90 degree angle, you're straining and your puborectalis muscle squeezing and it's squeezing off the end of the anal canal. Well, when you're pushing down, and then you have a muscle that's squeezing, everything there isn't moving. And so eventually after time and time again of doing this, you'll end up teaching your anal canal not to empty anymore. And that's what ends up having with pelvic floor dysfunction. We see a lot of that. On the right side, again, that puborectalis muscle, nice and relaxed, ready to have a straight bowel movement, no wiping, amazing, everybody's happy. So why does it matter? Why does it matter that you just, that we, follow these things and we take care of our colons and our rectums and our anuses, it matters because when you have poor defecation, it leads to abdominal pain, bloating, anal rectal issues. So a lot of the times what we see in the office is the end result of years of not pooping well. So I always tell my patients, every butt tells a story. You'll tell the patients, they'll come in and say, I'm pooping really well. And then you look and you're like, no, you can't be because you have hemorrhoids, you have fissures, you can't get things out and you don't know any better. It's just kind of things that happen over time. And so if you start adding these things in that I just talked about, it will prevent these internal hemorrhoids from happening. It'll prevent you from getting external hemorrhoids with pain, fissures, which are paper cuts of the anal canal, fistulas, which are connections from the inside to the outside that are not supposed to be there. And so all of these things can be prevented by taking care of your colon, your rectum and your anus. So it, it really is worth it for you to invest in it. Again, kind of just touching on the pelvic floor anatomy. What if you don't? What if you don't poop the way you're supposed to? Or what if you don't, you know, what if it's not happening? On the left side is the normal pelvic floor. And you can see that the rectum's straight. And this is obviously female. On the right side, if, you're, if your anal canal is closing and you're pushing down against that anal canal, what's supposed to happen is your rectum increases in pressure your anal canal opens and then you have a bowel movement. 
Well, on the right side, what ends up happening if you're, if you're trying to strain and your pubic rectalis is squeezing, you're closing off that anal canal and then you end up forming a pocket in the front called a rectocele. And it doesn't happen as much to men because they have a prostate. So the prostate protects that from happening, but it does, it does happen for a lot of women. And then you have these stool, this stool that sits in the pocket and you can't get the pocket to empty, which is also very uncomfortable. So if you don't invest in your colon and pelvic health now, you'll pay for it later. Um, and so I'm trying to, my biggest thing is just, if you take anything home, please, please take the tips that I, that I just talked about and poop better because, and if you're not pooping well, come see us, we're happy to help. Um, we do this all the time and, and we, we can make it better for you. We can, we can do it together. And I think it's really important for you to know that. So last thing I'm going to talk about before I transition over to Dr. Shanker is colorectal cancer. You, we need to stay cancer free, right? So the reason we screen, it's so important is that colorectal cancer is one of the cancers that we can actually prevent. Yes, actually prevent. Not every cancer can be prevented. Um, the way that it works is there's a polyp pathway where cancer turns into the inside of the colon first grows polyps. The polyps then grow, keep growing and turn into a cancer. If we screen you and do a colonoscopy, we can remove those polyps, which we are effectively then preventing colon cancer from happening. So that's the reason it's so important. We're seeing it in younger and younger patients. We just dropped the screening guidelines to 45 because of that. Um, also, if you have a family history of colorectal cancer or polyps, you should be screened to age 40 or 10 years before that, that family member was diagnosed. So please, please check your colon, you know, keep on the screening guidelines. I know people are nervous about the prep. It's really not that big of a deal. The worst part is the prep. The best part is the nap, I promise. Um, we keep you comfortable the whole time. No one's awake during it. Um, but it does really make a difference because if you have, you know, if you're taking care of your colon, but you're not keeping it cancer-free and adhering to screening guidelines, we're not really helping anybody. And we really want to help keep you out of trouble. So, um, so screening is really important. I know there's other tests. There's a fecal occult blood tests and there's Cologuard, which is the new thing. But at the end of the day, really the gold standard is, is colonoscopy because without seeing the inside of the colon, we can't hundred percent say that there's nothing there. Um, so we really wanna make sure that we're taking care of your colon in every way possible. So, and we're happy to help if we can help with anything. That being said, it will be, I'll be here afterwards and I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Shanker and um, she'll talk about colorectal cancer and diet. Thanks for letting me present tonight. I really look forward to questions and I'm even looking more forward to seeing how you're gonna incorporate fiber into your diet because it's gonna be fabulous. All right, hi, thanks for organizing this and for having me today. Um, I'm just gonna ask my tech advisor, how do I make my window smaller so I can see my screen? We're really good at operating in colorectal yes. surgery. We struggle slightly with IT issues, yeah. so just don't mind go. us. All right, thank you. All right, sorry about that. So I'm talking about cardiometabolic diseases and colon cancer and the power of prevention. There we go. So that's great. All right. So uh, just like Dr. McClure had uh, uh, mentioned, we know uh, that we can screen for colon cancers. Uh, you can uh, stick a camera in your anus and look at your entire colon, or you can poop in a talking box, or you could do a bunch of different things. And all of these things that you do will reduce your chance of dying from colon cancer by up to 75%. So something is better than nothing by a long shot. And so we have many options to hopefully identify either an early cancer or in the case of colonoscopy, um, find a, uh, a polyp and remove it before it becomes a cancer. But are there other things that we can do to help prevent colon cancer? So we're going to connect some cardiometabolic diseases and see how those issues actually impact colon cancer. 
So what is a cardiometabolic disease? It is a cluster of preventable metabolic abnormalities that lead to cardiovascular disease and diabetes. These include insulin resistance, and one in every three adults will have insulin resistance. I'll talk a little bit more about what that actually means. Risk factors for insulin resistance is overweight or obesity, getting older, having a relative with diabetes, certain ethnicities, physical inactivity, like Dr. McClure was just talking about, history of uh, diabetes during pregnancy, heart disease, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. All of those give people a risk factor for insulin resistance. High blood sugar, obesity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all of those also increase your chance of having these metabolic abnormalities. So what happens with high blood sugar? Why is this a problem? When you eat and that food is absorbed and you have sugar in your blood, your pancreas is gonna know that and it's gonna release insulin. Insulin's gonna, you take up that, that sugar out of your blood system, it's gonna stimulate the liver to store it and it's going to uh, stimulate your skeletal muscles to pick that up and store it too. And that's sort of part of the process of how our insulin and our blood sugar uh, works together. But when you have some of these risk factors I was talking about, such as visceral fat or obesity, this affects how that system works in a number of different ways. The fatty acids, one, are gonna uh, trigger a lot more cholesterol uh, production uh, from the liver. It's gonna in, even increase some glucose production. Um, and it is also going to prevent uh, the skeletal muscle from taking up sugar. So it's not gonna respond to the insulin. The fatty acids are gonna go into the skeletal cells prevent those insulin um, receptors from working and prevent that sugar from being taken out of the, the system and the bloodstream for storage. You know, what we see here um, is that um, there's different categories of cardiometabolic syndrome, the American National uh, Cholesterol Education Program, the um, World Health Organization, and they're talking about things I just mentioned, uh, fasting blood sugar, obesity, high cholesterol, uh, a low amount of good cholesterol, blood pressure. And they find that if you meet three or more of these uh, criteria, you have this cardiometabolic syndrome. Again, increasing blood pressure happens in a number of ways. The free fatty acids released from um, visceral uh, uh, fat around the organs cause constriction. Um, also, uh, this is gonna cause your kidneys to increase more salt and raise the blood pressure. And also sugar in the blood system is, is sticky and causes damage to the fine blood vessels. So this is when we think about the toes and the eyes, and this causes the retinopathy and the foot ulcers and affects your heart vessels leading to, to heart attack and heart disease. So these are all the impacts of high blood sugar, insulin resistance, and eventually diabetes. But how is this problem associated with colorectal cancer? So this uh, was uh, published in 2018. First, they were looking at people with known coronary artery disease and also looking at all the risk factors we were just talking about um, to see if people with these risk factors were more likely to have polyps and cancer. I think you can guess uh, what I'm gonna show you that when they look at these uh, risk factors, here they're using uh, the Framingham and uh, risk score and the heart score, they see that the more risk factors you have the more likely that they're gonna find polyps and cancer. For coronary artery disease alone, compared to people with it or without it, they're gonna find more polyps and they're gonna find more advanced uh, uh, cancers. And so ultimately what they find is with people with cardiovascular risk factors, regardless of looking at the Framingham or the European heart score, they found an increased risk of polyps in the right and the left colon and people undergoing uh, just um, uh, normal screening colonoscopies. And also in the rectum, they found a more pronounced distribution in our Framingham risk score, but uh, also in patients with type two diabetes to have more uh, polyps in the right side of the colon. What about obesity and overweight and cancer? This is from the National Cancer Institute showing the increased risk of uh, uh, cancer uh, in all these solid organs associated with obesity, including colon and rectal cancer. So how do we link obesity and colon and rectal cancer? This was published in 2020. 
The top line here is showing you the entire world population from 1975 to 2016 to project it in 2035. You can see in 1975 across the world, a little over 20% of uh, men and women were overweight with six and 3% being obese. That increased in 2016 to close to 40% uh, being overweight. And in 2016, 15% of uh, women and 11% of men being obese. You can see the projections for 2035. What happens if we look at specifically the United States? Here we're being compared to China because they had a natural change in diet, adopting more of an American diet over time. So in the top graph there, you're seeing that in the, uh, the United States in 1975, we had way more obese, uh, overweight people. 45% um, of men at that time were overweight. You can see as you move to 2015, uh, over 70% of uh, men overweight at about 35% of men and women obese. And you can see the projection for 2035 getting close to 90%. All right, and this is just uh, smaller versions of the graph I just uh, showed you. So what that means is that uh, when we link obesity to colon cancer, we see um, in a meta-analysis of a number of publications that for every 10 kilograms about uh, uh, 20 pounds of weight gained, you have an 8% increase in colon cancer. And they also see that in people who have undergone bariatric surgery, they have a near 30% reduction in colorectal cancer. So they see a, a correlation here between the weight and the increased risk of cancer. And getting into the weeds, how does it work? I won't give you a quiz afterwards, but I'll give you, maybe, I'll give you a, a few slides that show it. The word they use in science is domesticate. The cancer cells domesticate the host fat cells to help feed it grow and help it metastasize. So uh, we find that when we take out colon sections um, from, uh, that contain cancer, they're surrounded by fat. And that's part of the cancer process of recruiting fat cells um, over over to it to supply um, uh, both the nutrients and the stimulating single signals that it needs to grow and to migrate, meaning to metastasize to other organs. Here we see uh, uh, the hormones and what we call adipokines, which are other um, signaling cells that are specific to fat tissue, which produces over 20 hormones and signaling cells. And this causes an increase in insulin, insulin growth factor, which causes an increase in growth of colon cancer. Increase in leptin uh, specific uh, to some of our, our visceral fat, which causes um, a decrease in the ability of the cancer cells to die. And we see a reduction in some of the fighting uh, uh, hormones that help stave off the leptin, like the adiponectin that you see on the screen there. Chronic inflammation is something that we find uh, both with obesity and cancer. So some of the things you see in the gray boxes, the interleukins and the TNF alpha there, we see those in um, our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. That's a chronic uh, inflammatory condition. And people with in, uh, inflammatory bowel disease have an increased risk of colon cancer. Uh, they get screened more often for that specific reason. And interestingly, we find these same things increase more often in patients who have surgery and then have a leak or a breakdown of their new connection afterwards. So anything that causes chronic inflammation um, is bad in terms of surgery and in terms of cancer. And so with increased visceral fat, uh, we see a significant increase in these chronic inflammatory conditions, which are, are associated with an increased risk of cancer. Other things that I didn't mention besides the inflammation are the gut microbiota. Uh, what you think of as the healthy bacteria produce these food for your uh, lining of your colon, these short chain fatty acids. And when you uh, don't have this good bacteria from diet, which is, has an association sometimes with obesity, you, um, you're prone to more inflammation and changes in that lining of your colon, which leads to cancer. Same thing with bile acids, something that is made in the liver, typically stored in the gallbladder and is used to help us digest food. In obesity with excess amount of bile, it ends up being dumped from the small intestine into the colon. And that is very carcinogenic, meaning causes transformative changes into the lining of your colon, leading to colon cancer. This is from the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. This was published in 2020, showing over 15 years, 71% of Americans are overweight and obese. That's over 100 million people from processed foods, fast foods, and that this is killing people more than cigarette smoking. 
and uh, ooh, I passed the slide, but that's okay. Um, and, and so uh, what uh, we see is that with processed foods, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, that you have, uh, sure, oh, th thank you. I'm glad I have tech support Anytime. here, thank you. Uh, what we see is that with people with more <laughs> amount of animal product consumption and processed foods, uh, they are more likely not only to have cancers, but also to have dementia and mel uh, mental illness and a shorter life expectancy. So all bad things that, that can go along with that problem. This was published in Cell, which is one of the leaning um, like uh, molecular journals. And this is uh, talking about the hallmarks of cancer and how the uh, cancer cell works. And they were just talking about like the cancer cell is there, it grows, it invades the own your own body from killing it. Um, and it uses your own body to help it grow and to spread. Uh, 10 years later, they published an update to that article that showed how different chemotherapy agents target that process um, of uh, colon cancer cell growth, but also to note uh, that a healthy diet with fruits and vegetables target the same process. All right. So colorectal cancer and nutrition. This was published by Henry Ford Hospital here in Detroit in 2019. They did an analysis of all sorts of different, different uh, nutritional factors that can be associated specifically with colon cancer. Not every st study ever agrees with other studies and you'll see that in their publication, but a majority of studies they looked at showed a link between red meat consumption and colorectal cancer. They showed a link between alcohol consumption and colorectal cancer. They also showed low vitamin D levels and low calcium levels are associated with colon cancer. Calcium has been also well studied, I would say, in prostate cancer, showing a specific link between dairy and prostate cancer. And just to um, uh, make a reminder that a lot of dark green leafy vegetables have excellent sources of calcium, so it doesn't necessarily have to come from dairy. They also show that you get a diagnosis of colon cancer, you undergo a surgery. Afterwards, if people are still on a diet with it, which is high in meat, red meat, sweets, and refined uh, grains, and don't have that fiber that Dr. McClure was talking about, you have a higher rate of the cancer coming back and a decreased um, uh, like window of survival. And uh, studies also show that increasing your fiber to the levels that Dr. McClure was recommending decreases your recurrence rate from nearly 20% down to 14%. Uh, look at that nice picture of vegetables. All right, so which vegetables are the ones you want? All vegetables are gonna be excellent. So of course that color of the rainbow Dr. McClure was talking about before is what you're thinking about. Specifically for cancer, um, actually the government puts out a study every few years where they measure the antioxidant rates of all different fruits and vegetables. And that's just free and something uh, you can look at um, if you want to. Uh, but here that they show the highest cancer fighting vegetables are the cruciferous type. This is broccoli and cauliflower. And the allium type, this is garlic. Um, this is onions and this is leeks. So all of those things are great with those anti-cancer um, effects. What resources do you have if you say, hey, I wanna make some lifestyle changes? You can always do some things on your own. So there are some books out here that I mentioned. How Not to Die also has a website and free um, videos that you can look at. And Forks Over Knives is another thing that a lot of our IHA primary doctors also recommend and I think has a documentary associated with it that you can watch. And most of these, when they're talking about plant-based diets are really meant uh, like promoting that sort of vegan vegetarian lifestyle. Uh, the food diet I have on the far side of the screen with Mark Hyman, he runs the functional medicine clinic at Cleveland Clinic. And he talks about the vegan diet, which is combining keleo and vegan diet. All of them give great information on how the studies are performed, what information they're looking at. And I find that they all are showing you similar information, showing that you can get good quality information and consistency across multiple um, resources. I would also say that IHA has a lifestyle medicine clinic and they partner with Rochester um, for a jumpstart program, which I'll show you, which in 15 days can reduce a lot of these risk factors that we were just talking about. And I'll have a slide on that in a moment. Um, so you can significantly reduce the risk of colon cancer and other cancers with lifestyle changes. And, um, you know, another thing that we think about is that 75% of uh, dietitians are Caucasian, but there is a growing number of uh, 
uh, professionals who are both African American or Latino. And so there are many publications. And I think these publications like uh, Tracy McCorder, who's like a, a dietitian to the stars, that has a publication on how to goal of 10,000 black women to go vegan last year. And she has a great book by any greens necessary. And a lot of these books are associated with recipes and other resources too. So I think there's something for everybody uh, to look at. All right, so this is the Jumpstart program. In 15 days, um, uh, patients have lost like uh, six to eight pounds, lower their blood pressure, have lowered their cholesterol by 26 to 44 points lower their bad cholesterol, that LDL cholesterol by 20 to 30 points and improve uh, their um, insulin resistance. And that's just in two weeks. So um, as a little bit, of, a lot of change in a small period of time has a huge impact to your body. It's never too late to start making changes or start thinking about it. And we're here to help you do that. And I think that is all I have. So I'm gonna bring you, Yay! Dr. McClough back Good over. Job. Yay, thank you. So we're gonna start we're going to stop there. You're welcome. We are Thank here you. to answer anything you want to know about colon, rectums, anuses, fibers. There's a lot. There's so much. There's so much, yes. Yeah, there was a study that looked at raw vegetables to steam or cooked vegetables, like different ways of preparing them. And so all ways that you prepare them will help get those fiber and nutrients into you. And, you know, you uh, just like Dr. McClure was saying, the best fiber to take is the fiber you're going to take. You know, if you don't like Metamucil and you're not going to take it, you're not going to take it. So all of them uh, will get nutrients into your body. Actually, what was interesting is that... Uh, they found that the highest level of beta carotene, so beta carotene we find in our orange vegetables like carrots, and that's a common blood marker they use in these nutrition studies to see the level of uh, uh, elements you're absorbing from these vegetables. And so they found that steaming vegetables was, uh, gave participants in these studies like the highest level of beta carotene in their bloodstream. However, they found decent levels despite the way it was prepared. So, you know, I would say any way you can prepare it. And of course, if you're trying to make a change, you're going to try a variety of different things. But hummus is a great way to get beans you know, as well as just buying a can of beans and cooking it. So uh, anything you do is going to help, but you don't lose nutrients necessarily by cooking it. So we always want to try. So the long answer is if you've tried everything else and you have a good plan, it's okay to be on. That we really, really want to avoid those if we can. Um, we really want to try and maximize fiber, water, things like that. So I guess um, you, it, it, some people do need them and, and there are certain people that need it. So I don't want to say that certain people shouldn't be on it, but you really want fiber, water, maximize all the dietary stuff that you can do first. And then you kind of want to start looking at other options, you know, increase, like we talked about increasing diet or exercise, increasing potentially some magnesium supplementation. There's a lot of things you can you can do before you get to the whoa we're on the Miralax section. It is true that your colon becomes dependent on the medications, and so we don't like using that as our first line. Um, and though in some patients they've gone through those lines and they need Miralax daily, right? So I guess it's it's a it's a definitely a patient specific, but I would try hard to not go right to that Miralax and actually figure out what the problem is and get on a good bowel regimen. And we are happy to help with that. So uh, yeah, di uh, diverticulitis tends to be a disease of the United States and Western Europe. And so we think that is linked to diet. Uh, this was first researched by um, a Dr. Uh, Burkett and Neil Painter. What they noticed in the first studies was that they were actually comparing African-Americans to Africans uh, who had a high plant-based diet and found that diseases such as colon cancer really didn't exist in cultures that were primarily plant-based. Uh, with, with low meats. In fact, they still found that in an update of that study today, where um, in a lot of African countries that have access now to more Western foods, uh, there's more obesity in, um, and people who are overweight, but they still don't consume a lot of meat. And so they're still actually sort of eating a lot of plants and more fiber than we are. And a lot of these cultures will have up to 70 grams of fiber a day, not even like the, the 30 that we're talking about. 
So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, diverticulitis, it definitely has a link to diet. I'm not saying that there's not a genetic component to it, but it's really uh, like a culturally specific disease. You can't make it go away. Once it's there, it's there. But what you can do is uh, improve the health of your colon. And when we say that, the more fiber you get, the more movement or peristalsis, to use the medical term you get, the softer and healthier your colon is going to be, and it's going to function uh, better. And so out of all the people who have diverticulosis, about 15% will go on to get the inflammatory disease you may hear about, like diverticulitis. So anything you can do, even if you're starting now to keep that colon healthy is going to pay off. And so it's all about the plants. Yeah, it's all about the plants. It's all about, it's all about the plants. plants. The yeah. rainbow. Eat the rainbow. rainbow. Yeah. But the other thing that it, the people think, they'll say like, oh, my mom had diverticulitis or my dad had, and there is a genetic component to it, but a lot of the genetic component also comes from how they were taught to eat, right? So we were taught to eat that meat and potatoes is how you start. So when you eat like that when you're younger and then you continue to eat like that when you're older and then you pass it on to your kids, it's kind of a cycle. And that's what Dr. Shanker was talking about. At some point you have to break the cycle, change your eating habits, and then that will get you out of the diverticulitis section. There's also good data to show that weight loss because diverticulitis is an inflammatory condition. Weight loss is actually one of the ways you can control it. So I know people ask, is it, is it safe to eat nuts and seeds or all these things true? There's actually no data to support that nuts, seeds, strawberries, popcorn makes a difference in diverticulitis or, or, or brings on episodes. There is data to show that if you're obese or you have, like there's a lot of abdominal fat and things like that, that the diverticulitis can get worse and become more inflammatory. So any kind of weight loss is going to help you, is the only thing that you can really control your diverticulitis along with the fiber-filled foods that Dr. Schenker was talking about. I would say when you're looking at cereal and you're looking at, or bread and something says whole grain, there's like a five to one ratio rule. So you wanna look at the total carbohydrate and the amount of fiber that they say it is. And if that ratio is higher than five to one, it's probably like a high carb and low fiber ratio. So that would be a cereal that I would avoid. So even though you'll see the Cheerio box, I'm sorry, not to call out Cheerios, the <laughs> Cheerio box that says like, hey, whole, whole grains or something like that. I think it's misleading advertisement. There is other cereals like um, Catalina Crunch and things like that, that are gonna have a low carb to fiber uh, ratio on it. And so you can uh, look at that. And if, the, if it's sort of less than that five to one ratio, I think you're gonna be able to get a lot of good fiber out of that. And the other thing I would say, it's not cereal, but like if you do a, um, I've been doing a lot of like the overnight oats Yes. With blueberries and banana and blackberries in it. And that's almost all of my fiber in one setting. And so like um, you can add chia seeds and it just is really yummy, super easy. You throw it in at night. You can make it a few days in advance. Um, and so I like it with yogurt. So for some people who can't do dairy, you know, and obviously, um, you know, some people are allergic to dairy or whatever, whatever dietary intolerances they have. But that's a really great option too. So it doesn't have to be like the whole milk and cereal. Yeah. There's lots of really good op other options that you can kind of think outside the box and make breakfast exciting. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I love the berries. That's like high in antioxidants. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, They're like so, eight grams yeah. of fiber for one cup. Yeah, so I mean, for like, bangs for your yes. box, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, so good. So good. Mm, so good. Yeah. Mm. So gallbladder pain is really right upper quadrant pain. Um, when you push up under your ribs and your right upper quadrant, uh, that's more gallbladder pain. It also is brought on a lot, a lot of times by eating. Colon pain is a hard, because you, your colon covers your entire abdomen, right? So some people will say, I have pain in my right lower quadrants. Gallbladder pain is not in your lower quadrants. Gallbladder pain is in your upper quadrants. Um, but I would definitely recommend you talk to your primary care provider or we're happy general surgeon, whoever's right. around Agreed. to kind of evaluate that. Cause there are some nuances and um, it's difficult without more of a physical history to kind of give you, but like theoretically overall, generally gallbladder is more up in the right upper quadrant. Colon oftentimes is lower. So first treat your pelvic floor. Get your colon excited, it's colon good. health. It's all about Squatty your pelvic potty. floor. Why yeah. do you have hemorrhoids, right? That's the first question we ask, squatty potty, all the things. So usually by getting yourself pooping better, your hemorrhoids will get better. 
That's the first thing. But if they don't, we have lots of great options for hemorrhoid treatment. Um, if for internal hemorrhoids, if you're, the symptoms of internal hemorrhoids are usually more the feeling of fullness. They will have bleeding, but painless. Um, sometimes they'll feel like their anal canal is closing. Those are more internal hemorrhoids. We can do banding for those. External hemorrhoids is not as easy. The treatment for external hemorrhoids is really surgery. Um, if needed, not everyone needs surgery for external hemorrhoids, but that is a much more um, in-depth procedure. So I would say come see us. We're happy to see you. We'll help you navigate all that um, and then answer your questions specifically for you. So just like Dr. McClure said, there's usually a fullness or achiness uh, with a hemorrhoid, and it's typically not painful. The painful hemorrhoids that we get are those outside hemorrhoids that are thrombos that look like a purple grape on the outside. That's really the main time you're going to have a hemorrhoid that's painful. Hemorrhoids bleed. Sometimes the inside hemorrhoids may fall out a little bit when you're pooping. You may have a little mucus drainage, but it's not typically a painful experience. Um, but a fissure can feel like when you go to the bathroom, you're pooping like sharp knives or razor blades. And so it's like a cut at the edge of the anal canal. Um, and that, that's quite severe and painful. But all those issues, I think if you're unsure what's happening, then we can see you and, and help figure it out. A majority of those problems will never need surgery to be um, remedied. And so there's a lot of things that we can offer to help alleviate those problems. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. So we- um, IBD is your jam. Is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Inflammatory bowel disease um, refers to a specific chronic autoimmune condition, and that is diagnosed by histology, meaning that somebody goes in to do a colonoscopy and they can see it in the lining of your colon and they take biopsies to confirm it a majority of the time. We can see it in imaging. And this is what uh, we talk about when we talk about um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So a type of chronic autoimmune uh, colonic disease with a higher risk of cancer. And it has symptoms typically associated with it like anemia, um, uh, diarrhea, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, incontinence or waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, uh, weight loss, and some uh, symptoms that are, aren't specific to the intestines like arthritis or pancreatitis or uh, visual issues. So it, it's something that's really specifically diagnosed on endoscopy and with a specific constellation of symptoms. Irritable bowel syndrome um, refers to sort of a more of a symptomatology that does not have like a diagnosis on biopsy. Uh, these uh, are called the Rome criteria. And it, uh, it really sort of refers to having chronic bloating and either uh, constipation uh, side where it's difficult to empty and you only feel relief from your bloating and your other symptoms when you do go to the bathroom or a diarrhea component, but it's not something that we see on colonoscopy. Um, it is a, a diagnosis of exclusion and it's treated symptomatically with specific medication and dietary changes. So there's a difference between the two, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease are totally different. And then to just back up, just really quickly, I have some pictures really quickly because I think it's so important. Like what we do is so visual. And so, um, you know, this is a picture of the anorectal canal. And so I know the question was between anal fissures or hemorrhoids. So if you look at the pictures right here, this is an external thrombosed hemorrhoid. You end up having um, an area in on the outside that looks like a grape and that's very, very painful, but doesn't usually bleed versus a fissure, which is right here. And that's the very outside of the anal canal that like Dr. Shanker was talking about, feels like you're tearing or ripping. Also, it'll be associated with what's called a sentinel pile, where there's a small skin tag on the outside. So oftentimes people will think, because you can only really feel the outside, they'll think that they have a hemorrhoid and that's what's painful. But actually what's painful is the fissure underneath. So when you look at the anal fissure, here is some of the other pictures you can see that show the fissures in the anal canal. And then when you look at hemorrhoids, so act like we talked about external, this is actually this nice pink part here is internal. And so for internal hemorrhoids, they're above the dentate line or the transition from outside to inside. The external hemorrhoids are on the outside, but sometimes they can come out. So it is, it's important if you're not sure what you're looking at or you're not sure what you're feeling to come in and evaluate, but hopefully this helps a little bit 
to kind of just give you a little, some pictures of the anal canal and what you're looking at. It is your pelvic floor. If you know, so the first thing we want to do, obviously, is we want to rule out colon cancer, right? That's the thing we always worry about, colon erectile cancer. When you have changes in stool caliber, which is why you need to look at your poop every day, then if you have the changes in stool caliber, it can be because you have a cancer at the very end of your colon. But that was not the, that's not usually the case, but it, we always want to rule out the bad things first, right? Normally, it's because like we were talking about that pubic rectalis muscle is really tight. And so it's not, you're basically forcing the stool out of your anal canal. So it's like a, a reverse ice cream cone. And that's not what you want to happen. So oftentimes it's because your anal canal isn't opening and that's why your stools are pencil thin. So again, come see us, we will help. So there's two categories of laxatives. There is stimulant laxatives and there is osmotic laxatives. A stimulant laxative is like Ducalax. With, regardless of what form you take, the way it works is that it causes your colon to like squeeze in and out and to propel the stool along. That type of laxative is becomes sort of highly addictive where your colon gets very dependent on it quickly. So stimulant laxatives will work the fastest. You take it, you're going to go to the bathroom right away. You'll have a lot of abdominal cramping with it, um, but your, your body can get dependent on that uh, quickly. The osmotic laxatives like Miralax open up the chloride channels and allow for an increase in water um, in your system. In a similar way, some of the prescription medicines like Linzess open up your like uh, bicarbonate channels and allow uh, for, for increased secretion into the colon. So these um, osmotic types of laxatives uh, result in less dependency of your body on them to keep working. Um, so that's why when you go to the doctor and you know you say, hey, I've tried all the fiber, all the things, and they start you on something, most of them tend to start you on an osmotic laxative like Miralax and not a, a stimulant laxative uh, like Ducaset so, or Ducalax. So those are some of the differences between them. And you can always talk to your pharmacist if you're buying something over the counter and just confirm whether it's a stimulant or osmotic laxative. The osmotic laxatives will take longer to work. So you may take a dose of Miralax and it may not work for like a day or a little bit more. So don't like take half the bottle because, um, <laughs> or you'll get a colonoscopy, you can do that. <laughs> could do that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, just take the dose and give it a time. Um, uh, other uh, things that we talked about before that Dr. McClure mentioned was magnesium. Most women over 60 get a little bit low in the magnesium and the magnesium is helpful for the bowel function and, and it, you need it for your like neural cells and your endo, like um, your gut cells to function. So uh, taking a magnesium supplement is something that can also um, assist with bowel function. But there is a difference between the two. And if you're gonna take something, the yeah. first choice would be um, an osmotic laxative. So examples of osmotics are magnesium citrate. I totally agree with what Dr. Strange said. Magnesium citrate, um, milk of magnesia, Miralax, those are the osmotic ones. Dolcalax, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Those are the like biggest ones. Glycerin suppositories. Glycerin suppositories. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. Those are the things you want to avoid if you can avoid help that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Come see us. Okay. That's always the answer, right? Come see us. Because it's hard to see in there, right? You can't see. It's difficult. But no, so normally it's not, right? I will tell you. Usually it's either hemorrhoids, it's a fissure, it's something else. It's usually something that's not cancer. That being said, we always want to rule out cancer first because um, it's the big bad thing in the room, right? So definitely it's not normal to have blood in your stool every time you have a bowel movement. So you should definitely come see us so we can get a plan together. Yeah, so what I would say is that when somebody <laughs> comes to us with a gut disorder and we think that may be part of the picture, often we work with our gastroenterology colleagues because you know, gluten intolerance really is a, a problem with the small intestine and not the colon. And so uh, they may do upper endoscopy or blood work 
to look for celiac disease and gluten intolerance, and those will have specific diets. And so we may partner with them if we think that there is a true malabsorption problem going on. Um, and that is something that also the lifestyle medicine clinic can be helpful because when you say, hey, I want to make diet and lifestyle changes, but I may have a gluten allergy or a malabsorption problem, they can adjust their plans for that. Um, sometimes people do see us um, as a workup for their hemorrhoids or their anal rectal bleeding. And we, and we may start the ball rolling and, and get some of this testing done uh, to help with our colleagues and, and seeing if there's malabsorption. But overall, I would say malabsorption is actually kind of rare in terms of gluten and celiac disease. Most people as they get older have a limited amount of dairy that they can absorb when we lose a lot of our ability to absorb uh, uh, lactose, but, uh, but gluten is rarer or I should say more rare. So um, when you see us, if that is a problem, we may work with some of our colleagues to really, you know, uh, uh, parcel out if it's a true malabsorption issue or something else going on. So we specialize in people who are usually 16 or older, um, but there are, you know, there's common things from what we talked about that go, that quite carry through no matter what age you are. So increasing water, um, increasing fiber, adding grape, like our prune juice, things like that, that are kind of make things go. So if those things haven't worked, I would definitely, you know, talk to the pediatrician. Um, sometimes kids are having trouble. They have holding issues where they're holding it and then they, they don't want to go. And so you kind of have to go through, is it functional? Is it structural? What's going through that? So a lot of the concepts that we talked about today, you can apply to the kids, but really if they're not pooping and those don't work, I would definitely talk to your pediatrician. Oh, you just need a taller squatty potty. They come in multiple, they do. They seven come in inches, nine inches, many size, size matters size in matters. squatty potties. That's what you need to know. You can get um, a travel squatty yeah, potty. Yeah, there's a travel squatty so potty. So you go on vacation yeah. and you can take your squat potty. Yeah, and you can, there's also yes. travel bidets. I'm just well, saying, yeah. if you need to take them, it, okay. there's- Because you need a squirt. You need afterwards. a squirt after yes. you're done. So no, it is not a bad thing. We are not saying comfort toilets are bad. We're just saying, please just keep your knees above your hips. Your butt will thank you. So a lot of times when people feel pressure in or around the anus, it's because of your levators and your muscles of the pelvic floor that become really tight. And I'm going to switch over and share my screen really quick um, because I have some good pelvic floor pictures. Um, but really it's the muscles of the pelvic floor that become really tight. And so when that happens, the pelvic floor musculature, um, so this is anus here, and this is your pubic rectalis, that muscle we were talking about earlier and then the other muscles of the, of the levator ani. And so it's actually called levator syndrome. Um, and so these muscles will squeeze very tight. And then when that happens, it makes people feel like they're sitting on a ball. It'll make people feel like they have um, something inside the anus that's driving them crazy. They can have pain radiating down their legs. If they have an orgasm, it can make them feel like they need to poop or there's pain. Um, so those are all things that can happen with levator ani syndrome. Sometimes it'll wake people up at night. Um, but then it'll go away just as quick as it came. So that's usually what's causing pressure in the pelvic floor is because the pelvic floor isn't opening correctly. And pelvic floor physical therapy, I have to give a shout out to our PT. Um, oh, they're so good. <laughs> they're yeah. so good. Our pelvic floor physical therapists are like the best ever in this area. We are so blessed to have them. Um, and so we oftentimes with physical therapy alone, we can, we can teach you how to stop doing this. Like you're not doing it on purpose, but how to undo the, the pelvic floor dysfunction that's happened and get you not feeling like you have something in your butt. Um, so it is very, for people that, that suffer from this, it's really awful because every time they sit down, if they bike, if they sit in a bucket seat, anything that pulls their butt cheeks apart, it'll start to squeeze and, and they'll feel it. So, um, you know, we have, to, if people are having those issues, we definitely have amazing, amazing pelvic floor physical therapists that we work with that are just wonderful and we're so lucky to have them and they make people feel so much better. I I mean, we've yeah, all gone through PT, right? Everyone needs pelvic floor physical therapy. That's the one thing I didn't put on there. Squatty potty, we did, PT, yeah. but you need it. You, you need everybody it. needs it. I mean, you get shoulder surgery, you go to physical therapy, <laughs> yeah. okay, you get knee surgery. You right. Know, you have, you have babies, you butt. should have physical oh, therapy. You definitely have physical Absolutely. Therapy. Everybody needs physical therapy. All of it. And it's not surgery. That's the best thing. 
we are colorectal surgeons, but so much of what we do is education and, you know, yeah. local therapies. It's not all surgery. So I know people are scared to come see us, but it won't be bad. I promise. Yeah. And t-shirts are available at the end. Oh, yeah. It does get better. It does get better. It's just it's yeah. awkward and people don't like to talk about it. I saw one of the questions was, why do we do? And it is because like people talk about breast cancer now, like it's no big deal, but they don't want to talk about, like say the tatas, but nobody talks about the anus. And so, I mean, honestly, I feel like yeah. it's, if you're, if you cannot poop, if your butt hurts, if, if your quality of life, you can't even pay attention to other people talking because you, everything it's bothering you. Like you have so many nerve endings down there. It's a quality of life issue. Um, we also do a lot of robotic surgery, rectal cancer, colon cancer, people have great outcomes with those things. And so, I mean, I think that both of us find it really rewarding yeah. from a standpoint of agree, yeah. of being able to fix the problem and, and then giving you your quality of life back. And that's really why, why we do what we do. What I'll tell you about probiotics is that they're not FDA approved. And so what's in them isn't guaranteed. That doesn't mean that they're bad. The best probiotics is in plants. Sometimes we use them in a surgical setting. Certain patients will get fecal transplants for infections that don't clean up, clear up. So that's like sort of a, a medical surgical way that we really provide like a fe uh, fecal transplant or a, a real probiotic where we actually know what's getting into the patient. But probiotics, um, I think there's been another number of studies. Uh, they've been run by the University of Chicago and other places where they look at all the name brands that you see and they actually look to see what's actually in them. And so they find that a lot of them don't have everything or the quantity that they claim they have. And some of them have the pathobiome. A few of them have had mold in the most recent breakdown study. That doesn't mean you're gonna take them and get sick from them. I definitely don't recommend them to people who are immunosuppressed, like transplant patients or things like that who are on like long-term immunosuppressants. If there's a chance you purchase something that may have mold in it or a bad thing in it, then um, it's not uh, it's it's not worth it for for a benefit that's a little bit unclear. Uh, that being said, for most people, if you take one and you find that it's helpful for you, there is no harm in taking it. The best way to get a healthy gut flora is through like a healthy diet. That's the best way that you're going to be able to get it. But for most people, it may be helpful just as something that doesn't have to go through an FDA approval process. We can't guarantee that you're going to get what's on the bottle. Colitis is a broad term, and the word itis on the end of anything means inflammation. So you could have colitis that we talk about the autoimmune diseases we mentioned before, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. You could get food poisoning and have bacterial colitis. You can, uh, you know, get that uh, like a bug from like your kids and get like a viral enteritis or colitis. So it just refers to either an acute or chronic state of inflammation. Same with diverticulitis. So it doesn't represent uh, like one specific disease as much as an inflammatory state. And that inflammatory state may be chronic, like in Crohn's, or it may be acute, like I ate some bad food. And the way that we uh, treat it just really depends on the underlying cause. If you have like, if you feel sick or you have diarrhea or a symptom and you go to um, the hospital and they get a CT scan or some imaging that says colitis, they're just talking about some features of inflammation that they may see on the imaging, but that's not necessarily specific to a disease process. They may see like thickening of the colon on it maybe what they call a little bit of stranding, meaning some inflammation in the fat around the colon, but it's not diagnostic of a specific disease. So you eat some bad food and get a bacterial like uh, colitis, you may get antibiotics or just bowel rest. Uh, you have Crohn's disease, you get medications for it. You have diverticulitis, you may get a specific diet for it. So it, it all depends on the cause, but it just refers to acute or chronic inflammatory state. Yeah, anal papillas, papillas, right? Yeah. So there's anal papillas, which are kind of in the anal rectal area, which is probably what they're talking about. Um, and if not, you know, type in here and we'll, we'll clarify. Um, but at the dentate line, there's a little transition zone where from the inside to outside, um, you can get little, you have little crypts. And in those crypts, the papillas can become in, enlarged. So it's very common to have hypertrophic papillas or anal papillas um, or rectal papillas, and they're benign. Um, so they don't necessarily need to be removed. 
Um, but if they, sometimes they'll prolapse. And so if that happens, then those are times where we do sometimes take them off. So different than colitis, because that's more in the rectal, rectal anal area, colitis is kind of throughout the colon. There are a few questions I've been looking at. I just want to make sure I touch on. So there's a virtual question about a virtual colonoscopy. Mm. A virtual colonoscopy, you have to still prep. So you don't get out of the prep. Um, and then you have to have polyps that are about one centimeter before they can be, you can be seen. And so anytime you have a polyp over two centimeters, you have a 20% risk of cancer. So a virtual colonoscopy does not really replace a st gold standard colonoscopy. So I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Um, the reason is with a virtual colonoscopy, you already need a polyp that's one centimeter to be able to, to indicate that something is wrong. And it, you've, you've already at that point, let the polyp get big enough to potentially have a cancer in it. So just want to make sure that we're, you know, that we answer that question about the virtual colonoscopy. Cause I think some people think, well, I wanted to do a prep or it'll be easier. Yeah. I want to, and so, but you still have to prep and then they put a whole bunch of air inside of you and you're awake. Yeah, so right. from a grand yeah. scheme of things, I would not recommend doing that. Yeah, those are all true. They put a lot, so you still have the risk of perforation and stuff because yeah, the exactly. amount of air that they they put in. If for certain for certain conditions, it may be the best option, uh, but uh, but still incurs a similar risk to colonoscopy. And then, at what age do we stop getting scopes? Usually, it's eighty. Um, usually, we we recommend stopping at eighty. Now, I will tell you that some people live sometimes to ninety five or a hundred. So the problem is, if you've had a history of polyps. Um, a lot of times at, at 80, we'll discuss with you the risk of continuing your screening versus the risk of stopping the screening. The question is always going to be, do you want me to operate on you if I were to find a cancer, right? If the answer is yes, we should continue the screening to make sure that you yeah. don't, we don't get you into trouble. We do operate on 95 year olds that come in yeah. that are obstructed that we could have prevented had we continued those scopes. So the data shows usually at 80 with the life expectancy of most people, that's where we stop screening, but we, we, it's a very much an individual decision because some patients at 80 are doing great and they're, you know, they're living their life and, and yeah. their gene, they have great genes and they're going to live till 95. So those patients, I would definitely recommend continuing screening. Agree. Yes. It is okay to take mag citrate as long as you've done the other things. So as long as you're doing fiber water, squatty potty, all the good things, if you need to rely on some of those other things, Feel free to do it. We just want to make sure you're pooping, right? Because if, no, if you aren't pooping, nobody's happy. Yeah, no, I will say that um, so far, there has been no like double blind at randomized trial or anything like that. So we're talking about type of studies that would compare the Cologar test, that's the DNA test, to colonoscopy, to a fecal occult blood test, to um, that virtual colonoscopy. So they haven't been compared to each other. And what we do know is that any screening you do is likely to reduce your risk of death. Mm -hmm. So anything you do is helpful. And so sometimes, you know, we have to meet people where they are. I certainly had patients who had a colonoscopy and had a very rare complication of a perforation or a family member with that complication, and then they were afraid to get it. And I always want to make sure people get something rather than do nothing. So uh, anything you do will, per will help detect a cancer early and will prevent your chance of death. It's true that one of the risks of a colonoscopy is people can have anywhere from three feet of colon to six feet of colon. Sometimes we can't make it around the whole thing. It's safe or there is disease in there and we're afraid will cause a perforation or a complication. Those may be the patients if we're preparing for a surgery or intervention or trying to decide how to proceed. We may do that virtual colonoscopy or a barium enema or something to try to get a sense of what we can't complete with a colonoscopy. So those are less common and rare, um, but those will be instances where we may choose another test. But again, that's not for screening, that may be for diagnostic purposes. So what I would overall say is that we consider the colonoscopy the gold standard for what Amanda McClure said, which is that if we find a polyp, we can remove it and prevent it from becoming a cancer. We can also look for other things besides polyps, like mm -hmm. Crohn's disease, colitis, things to explain your bleeding, things like that. But anything you do will decrease your risk of colon cancer. So definitely poop in a box. Poop in a box. If that's the only thing you're going to do, do. Poop, poop in the box. Poop it, it talks. <laughs> it talks. It talks. It <laughs> comes to swimming pools. Like, I don't know why a swimming pool would make you want to poop in a box, but there it is. Yeah. So do all polyps have cancer in them? No. 
Um, there's two different types of polyps. One is adenomatous, which is a type that can develop into cancer over time. And then the other one is hyperplastic, which has a very low risk of developing into cancer. Um, the adenomatous polyps are the ones we worry about because, and, and just because we remove a polyp does not necessarily recommend, does not mean that you have cancer in that polyp. What it tells us is that your colon is forming polyps. And so it tells us we need to screen you more often. So we don't ever let that polyp get to a cancer. So oftentimes when we remove the polyps, they actually don't have cancer in them, but they tell us that you make polyps and there's, you're a polyp former. So you need a polyp farmer, which is where we come in. And then we remove them so that you never turn in, it doesn't ever turn into a cancer. Um, so not all polyps have cancer. And if you have polyps, I know some people feel like after we come out and talk to them after the colonoscopy, we're like, you had a few polyps and they're like, oh man, like they feel like they failed. It's okay. Like if you have polyps, you know, yes, we want you to increase your fiber. We want you to do your water make sure you do all the things that we just talked about. But if you, some people just have them still. So all that means is we have to screen you more often than the every 10 years to make sure that we're removing those polyps. So they never have a chance to get to cancer. We just want to keep you out of trouble. Well, first of all, we thank you for organizing this. Yes, thank this. you for this having us. Really this is fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> we clearly love talking we, about poop. Yeah, we anuses, love talking about anuses. anuses. That's right. great. I mean, it's yeah, wonderful. I think so. Um, yeah, we just encourage people to get their screening, do what they can for their health. Um, if you're not sure about anything, reach out to us. We're yes. happy to take care of you. That's what we're here for. Yes. And we hope this was helpful. Yes. And don't be embarrassed. Like, we want to make this as comfortable as possible. I know people don't want to talk about it, but everybody poops for real. So bring, bring us your bums. We'll help you with it. Right. We're, we're here to help bums for sure. Yes. Thank All you. Right, thank Have you. a great night. Bye. Bye.